Okay, today on the bench we have a GE Super Base. Uh, the model number is 3 5875 A. Uh, fantastic radios. I love these things. They are a pain in the ass to work on <laughs> um, due to their design. And that's because they use dual circuit boards that are stacked back to back. Um, done lots of videos, so I don't need to go into that. You can see one board's up here, and then of course the other board. All of the components are down here. So, yay. Oh, let me turn my monitor radio off. Hold on just a second. Let's hit mute. But, um, this one, unfortunately, needs uh, more than just a cap job. Now, it does work. I gotta give it that. It does work. Um, but it needs to be restored, so, you know, needs the normal things, even for a working radio. It's old, so the electrolytic capacitors need to be replaced. Actually, I have not even inspected the normal leaky capacitor on this to see if it's going to need any circuit trace repair. Actually, we can investigate that together. I always hope not. <laughs> it's not that I don't like doing them, but it is very... And yeah, I think I see... Yep, I see corrosion. Uh, get a flashlight here. Yep, it's leaked. They almost always leak in these things. So, but it does work. That's a good sign. And as long as the corrosion's not too bad, I'll be able to just clean it off and put some epoxy overcoat over top of it to fix the traces back up. But you see all that bubbled overcoat on these traces? This capacitor has leaked. Yeah, you can see how dark it is. Underneath, see, it should be this nice light-colored green. See how dark it is? That's because the copper foil that's underneath of that epoxy overcoat is oxidized. And it will go in every direction. Every, all branched out for all the traces that run underneath and around that capacitor. They're all going to be corroded. And if you don't take care of that, I mean, you can remove the leaky cap and stick a new one in. The you know corrosive uh, oil out of this capacitor, it's still trapped in here. And it's just going to, over the years, continue to, you know, creep out farther and farther and farther it'll just wick its way underneath of there and continue to eat the traces until they finally break in half so that has to be taken care of but like i say it does transmit and receive so none of the traces are completely corroded in half yet so that'll just be basically as long as it's not too bad usually all you have to do is take the cap out um take a good now that that's where you see me often using fiberglass brushes like this yeah this one's not so good for doing what i want to do here I actually need, uh, actually I need to find which little bin I have that in. Uh, there's a brass one, there's a stainless steel. Oh, for God's sakes, where in the hell is my fiberglass one? There it is. <laughs> I've got lots of rush erasers that have with brass in it. This one's all metal, it's got a stainless steel brush. This is the one with the, the fiberglass bristles, but it's really, really hard. Now, you have to be careful when using this brush because it will, if you scrape for too long, you'll rub the trace right off of the board. You'll just go right through it, but that's good for getting the overcoat off and the corrosion, but uh, so I'll have to do that to this. But like I said, we'll keep fingers crossed. I don't actually have to re replace any traces. The big problem with this radio is, and you may have noticed it when the radio was upright, you can see it. To me, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, I knew to look for it when I got the radio from the customer, but uh, it's fairly clear to see, especially if you look at it from this angle. Something just isn't right with this picture. This transformer. Why is it leaning? <laughs> it's It looks kind of like that. Yes, this radio was dropped. Um, I'm not sure if this happened in shipping to the customer or if it was like this, you know, happened previously. He bought it and then, you know, it's just as it is. But uh, it, it took a hard hit, and I mean a really hard hit, because it not only bent that, it broke the faceplate. It buckled, actually, if you look here, I just need to look down at an angle. But this aluminum plate here, it's buckled. The face plate is broken. You can see there's a crack. Runs the whole way up to the speaker right here. 
where the transformer is, you can probably notice there's a crease right here. So that's because the transformer buckled and got crammed down in. So it looks like it got dropped on this corner. The big problem here is you see that wave, the entire faceplate front structure, sheet metal, it's buckled. It's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> I, well, I don't know because I haven't dismantled it the whole way. But this shouldn't be too hard. I should be able to take this out once I get to face. I always take the face plates off of these. Not that I'm going to damage this one any worse than it already is. It already has to be replaced. Um, I mean, it can be fixed, but it's still going to be a broken, you know, because you can see I can stick my fingernail in there. It's, it's completely cracked. Uh, the big problem is if all the brakes were on the corners and just on the bottom, gluing that back together is no problem. You'll never see it in use. The problem is the crack progresses around to the front, and that's gonna that's you'll see that. Um, this I can, like I say, once I get the faceplate off, recess the switches in there, um, which drop down. Um, I can take this out on the hydraulic press, and I can probably just set this on the press bed bring the ram down and just push flat. I'll stick a block of aluminum in here. I'll just cut out a block of aluminum that fits squarely right in that transformer center area there and just press this entire thing flat. And that should be able to just get, get the chassis flattened back out. Of course, I'll have to over over press it. Um, you got to remember metal springy. So anytime, just like when you bend sheet metal, if you bend a piece of sheet metal at 90 degrees and a sheet metal break, well, as soon as you let down on the arm, it springs back a little bit. So you always have to overbend. So I had to press that down, but it didn't kink any of the, the bend there, which is the reinforcement. Um, and since the reinforcement's not bent, um, this should be fairly easy to flatten out. The front structure is what bothers me. It looks like it's really twisted and it's, it, it's not just buckled this way. It looks like the face, the, the whole structure. So trying to get something like that straightened out can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, the advantage is it's not that hard to get off that front structure. Just take all the nuts off for all the controls, unscrew the speaker, pop the display loose, and the entire front sheet metal structure should come off. Um, and then I can just replace it because luckily I have a graveyard of, uh, of radios uh, that I keep in inventory. And I have disassembled several GE Super Bases over time. Um, and when I say disassemble, I mean I completely blow radios apart. That way I don't have to, when I need a part, I don't have to go you know, dismantle the radio to get to it. It's already completely blown apart. So I have a perfectly good front sheet metal right here. So um, you can see that's you know, clearly the one that goes in this radio. Oop, it might help if I had it in the right orientation here so you can see. But So, yeah, I think... Like I said, I won't know until I get get the face plate off and really take a good look at it. But yeah, it's I, I can see on the underside it's creased here. This is bent and this is bent. And trying to get these three planes back in, I, I'm going to have to take it off to straighten it out. You know, if I can straighten it out in the radio, that's fine. I won't do it. But if if you know all three planes, it's bent in three dimensions. I really don't have a choice. I'm going to have to pull the faceplate out. I mean, it can be straightened, don't get me wrong. It can be straightened, but I'm going to have to take it out 100% anyhow. I'm going to have to take it down to this level in the first place. So yeah, if I do that, I'll just stick this one in because I have several of these already pulled. So I've already got good sheet metal. The bottom cover has to be replaced. It's, it's, it's bent pretty damn bad. Again, it's just going to be simpler just to pop in a one that's not bent. Um, the feet are broken off of it, so, you know... The uh, the other plates are already going to have the feet on it. Um, same thing with the top cover. It's tweaked and bent, and I have not only that, I have covers that are in better condition. So I'll just I'll probably just pop a a replacement cover on it. So yeah, I mean basically all this it's unfortunate. Really, all it needed at one point was a cap job, transceiver alignment, and definitely repair those traces because that's just going to progressively get worse. Even if you change that cap, those corroded traces, it's just going to continue to corrode to the end of time. Um, that needs to be, you know, neutralized, cleaned off, and re-overcoated. But, yeah, unfortunately, like I say, it got dropped. So, yeah, now it needs a faceplate, possibly front sheet metal structure. Um, the chassis, the main chassis structure needs to be straightened back out. But I'm pretty sure that can just, that can be taken care of in radio. Just a matter of pop this faceplate off. And I've shown it before in videos. There's little, two, 
depress these switches so they actually sit down below the uh, the surface right here. I know I've done a video showing that, but there's these little spring-loaded fingers here, so you pull out on both of these, and there's two little tabs here that you can put your fingers, and it just completely recesses that down in, into the radio. So now the switches are down below the sheet metal there. So like I said, I should be able to just set this radio upside down on a press bed and get that flattened out. Um, it looks like the rear structure's fine. Um, no kinks there. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but uh, we'll get her straightened out. And what do we have for a serial number? Fairly low. It's a it's a four digit, 1,095. So it's not as low as I've seen. I have worked on a, a double digit one at one time, but yeah, even 1,095. That's a really low serial number. Uh, so here's just the first in a uh, <laughs> in a bunch of videos I'm going to have to edit together because, like I say, this one does need a a little bit more work than uh, normal. You can see here, Christ, the, the plastic's shattered here. You can see where the cover, that's why I say the cover's screwed up. Because the cover got jammed into the backside. It broke out all the plastic there, broke it there, broke it here, kinked that. Yeah, it's just... Ah, so, what's, what's a lesson to be learned here? Proper packaging. Now, I'm not saying that somebody didn't drop this on the floor accidentally, but uh, odds are all this damage was caused in shipping. Um, if you properly package anything, I don't care, it doesn't have to be a radio, it can be a, a damn egg, an empty eggshell. If you properly package it, it will be guaranteed to get wherever you're sending it, um, you know, short of it being run over by a tank. You know, I always tell people, yeah, I bomb-proof package, and I do. I, I, I take extreme care. I take a lot, it takes me a long time to package it. When I do a radio like this, you know, any radio. But in, you know, when I package something up, it takes me a long time to package it. I use sheet sheet uh, extruded foam, and it's just very time consuming. Cutting pieces to fit perfectly around the radio. The problem, the big one of the biggest problems I see is people use packing peanuts. I wish they would ban those blasted things. Packing peanuts may be fine if you were shipping that empty eggshell. The eggshell is very light. Hence, you can use very light, fluffy packing materials. You see that? That's very heavy. That's a solid piece of steel in there. The robot's it's laminated, but there's a lot of steel and copper right here. It's transformers heavy, a lot of sheet metal. It's a heavy radio. There's a lot of weight here. You drop this box. If you put this thing in a box, put a couple inches of pe packing peanuts in it, set the radio in it, cover it the rest of the way with packing peanuts, all you got to do is drop this box once, and I'm not talking drop it from several feet. Just drop it. The normal bumps and bruises that a box takes in the normal transit, you know, from wherever to wherever, those packing peanuts quickly turn into packing peanut dust or packing peanut crumbs. And packing peanut crumbs or dust do absolutely nothing to protect this radio. Because once those packing peanuts start to break down, the radio can shift now. And that's the whole problem. A lot of times I'll get a box where a lot of... Some of the peanuts disintegrated. The rest of them are still fine. The problem is once the radio can move around, the packing peanuts are small. The radio can move out to the outside of the edge of the box. And it gets dropped and something like this can happen. Where if you use uh, bubble wrap, now even bubble wrap only has, a pla has its place up to a certain point. Um, you get into some of the really heavy tube rigs. Um, even bubble wrap has a hard time. Like, now you can get that in different grades. You can get that in a heavy duty stuff too. But like I say, I prefer foam. Um, it's a, it's a fairly rigid. If anybody's ever received one a radio from me when I worked on it, you're very familiar with how I package and what I use. But uh, yeah, I'd have to say this probably packaged just just poorly packaged. I mean, so luckily it's fixable. And is it worth it? Absolutely, yes. It's a GE Super Base. It's for starters, from a collector standpoint, it's a low serial number. It's not the lowest, but it is a low serial number. Um, it works. So it's not like it needs a shitload of diagnostic because, yeah, these things can have some weird oddball problems. Um, I just recently did one, uh, well, no, actually that wasn't so recently, but I did one um, that uh, took me a while to diagnose the damn thing. It had great, you know, was recap, was getting ready to do the alignment on it, and was doing the receiver alignment. AM sensitivity was fantastic, what you'd expect out of a GE Super Bass. Well, of course, sideband is where these things really, really shine. Quiet, you know, really good sensitivity. Um, 
sideband sensitivity absolutely sucked on this thing. Um, and it took me a while to find it. The, the, the thing was, you'd turn the radio on, and it, would, it wouldn't be too bad. It was still low, but it, it just wasn't right, you know. And then, like, within 30 seconds, it would go, it would just drop out. And it, it wasn't gone, but you'd have to crank the signal generator up considerably to be able to hear that, that signal again. What it ended up being was this transformer right here. So, anything I can figure is probably the, uh, this does have those tubular style capacitors inside, which a lot of transformer cans do. A lot of people forget that. It's not just a coil around a coil form in there, you know, to create a, tra a tunable transformer. Most of the time, these also have little teeny tiny capacitors inside of them, um, of an unknown value. So, it's not like I can just take the old one out, put a new one in. I have no idea of knowing what the value is. I can't exactly measure the old one because, well, the old one's bad. <laughs> so, but again, I have parts chassis, so I had an exact replacement. Pop the new, pop the uh, transformer in there. Received sensitivity was fine, but uh, yeah. So I mean, it works. This one works. You know, I know an alignment will bring me. It's actually the sensitivity is not too awful bad right now. So an alignment and a cap job will definitely make this thing a good work in radio. This one mainly just needs a lot of physical work and physical replacement parts. Definitely needs a faceplate, bottom and top covers for sure, and possibly some front sheet metal. But like I say, I have it all. It's all just you know sitting on a shelf from pallet racking inventory. So it's just a matter of see what I need. Like I already went out and got the already pulled the bottom and top cover and the front sheet metal. If there's anything else I need, like the mounting bracket for the clock mechanism, because I did see that didn't go down the whole way. That, but that could be hanging up on the front if it's bent really bad. So, I guess the next time you see this, I'll have her uh, pretty well disassembled. Yes, as I suspected, the faceplate sheet metal structure, yeah, it needs to be replaced. <laughs> it's bent in three dimensions, definitely. Um, so it's kind of hard to straighten this out while it's still on the radio. So I'm going to have to take it off anyhow. So yeah, it's going to get replaced. It's You can see it's bent there. It actually has a bow coming out from the speaker. The side gives buckles in right here. That should be basically straight back and there's, it's offset about that much. You can see it's actually creased in here. It's kinked. There's a kink line right there and it's actually pushed in right here. And yeah, it looks like this is where it took the damage, that corner. You can see how it's bent up. Yeah, it just what a shame. So, yep, sheet metals are coming off. <laughs> but, like I say, no problem, we have a replacement. And there we go, all torn apart. So, like I say, I've had to go through all this work to tear this thing apart. I'm just going to replace the sheet metal. So here it is. Like I say, it's, it's buckled. It's got a nasty bend in right there where that kink is. It's bent. In, it's just bent in every <laughs> direction you can think of. That's bent in the top. So, like I said, I've already got one <laughs> sitting a foot away from me. So I'll just replace the damn thing. It's going to have to come out anyhow to to do any of these repairs. So you know, I'll keep this one. I think I have like three more good ones. But you know, it's not like this thing's twisted into a pretzel. So you, know, you never know. Twenty years from now, I might need one. And when I'm finally, if I ever run out of them, if I don't end up end up with any more parts chassis. This one could be straightened out, but this this one is one of those ones that'll go to the back of the <laughs> back of the parts pile. Um, now, when you're doing something like this with a lot of screws, and actually not just a lot of screws, I will never ever understand the, the volume of radios that I get. Almost all of the cover screws are wrong. I don't know what do people eat the damn things when they work on radios. I've just I, I'm befuddled sometimes by the, I, I mean, four case screws in the side. They're usually larger. It'll be four completely different screws. It's not like somebody lost one screw and put in another one. You know, maybe a chrome one in place of a black one. There'll be three different, three different colors or, you know, four different colors and different lengths. And I mean... When you do something, anything, just taking, just to do an alignment on a radio, if you take the top and bottom covers off, put them in parts trays. I've got dozens of these trays like this. I've got, reach over here, I've got stacks and stacks of these little, they're like miniature Tupperware containers. Actually, there's some parts trapped in there. There's actually a ceramic resonator. 
not sure why that little guy is hiding in there, but in any case, you can get these. These are obviously made in China. They come with little, you know, little plastic lids. Like I say, they're not definitely not waterproof, but they're like little mini Tupperware containers. I buy these things from China in sticks of like, I think 20 or 25. I've got a couple hundred of them because they're so cheap. Figuring I'll just buy them now and have them. Um, but the only thing I really do to them is you'll see there is a little hole punched in the bottom of all of them. That way, when I put them together, they easily go together and they easily come apart. That way, you know, because the, the, you, you don't end up with a vacuum effect. But just keep track of your parts. Um, you know, short of dropping a screw on the floor, and yes, it gets eaten by the the you know, the, the screw deity <laughs> that you have to feed every once in a while that lives underneath of every repair tech's bench. Um, it's kind of like the sock monster that you know occasionally eats a sock. But uh, you know, just be neat. Lay out your parts, just like you took them out, so you can see here. I know where all these screws go. These two screws go in the top here. These two go here. The little brackets with screws, that's for this. These are the speakers. These are the four that go in the sides, the controls, everything. Just lay it out neatly on your bench. Use parts trays, whatever you need to do. When you put it back together, it's like a road map. It, kind of, it almost just falls back together. I mean... Yeah, I just never understand people losing screws. But there's what a GE Superbase looks like, completely blown apart. Um, and like I say, it's not that hard. It took me a few minutes. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not like it happened in one or two minutes. But, uh, you know, it's just a lot of screws. There's no wire cutting involved. Absolutely everything is either a screw or a nut. You know, all, all but what? One, two, six. All but six screws are, in a, are, are easily accessible from the outside, or the nuts. All the screws face from the outside. The ones for the switches, these little little tiny ones right here, they all come in from the front. The only screws you have to access from the back side are the four for the speaker and the two that hold in the display. And once you have this structure loose, once you have everything else loose, you can just lift it up a little bit, easily get these two screws, and then you can pull the whole thing out because the wires for the speaker are rather long because the audio circuit's over here. Um, you can just pull the whole sheet metal structure out, and then you can easily get to the four screws for the speaker. But uh, there you go. There it is, completely blown apart. So next time you see this, actually, I'll probably have it all this all back together. Um, I'll probably have that straightened out, the, the leaning tower of transformer. And... Uh, I'll show you what it looks like back together in a non-mangled format. The rest of the sheet metal actually looks good. This side structure, it's straight. Look back along there. So that didn't, you know, basically the damage stopped right here. It was a kind of, I guess, like a front up hit. So, you know, it, it couldn't bend, really bend. So straight back, still good. So everything, the rest of the chassis, it's just the where they're kind of a little wobbly right there. Um... You know, there is a bracket that comes down and touches the bottom cover, but it was dropped so hard that it actually shattered one of the feet on the bottom of it, so that's that's the whole reason the whole structure drops. So that means you, you can actually see this circuit board's actually leaning down, too. It's kind of down like that. So, just need to press that back up, and that should be fine. So, let me get to it. Okay, all back together now. Well, at least the front structure. And you can see the radio's on, and uh, it is working. Uh, let's see. <laughs> no faceplate, gotta remember what the hell's what. So it's receiving. Turn the squelch back up. Um, did notice the uh, this meter is inoperable, so I'll pop that back out really quick. Um, I'm gonna just leave the faceplate off. I always take the faceplates off of these radios. There's only six screws hold them on. It's unlike most radios that have can have lights or other things screwed into the actual faceplate, which makes you know. Oh, but I'm not going to say impossible to take off, but a pain in a butt. Um, these radios, on the other hand, aren't like that. Like I say, you, know, you drop the switch panel down right here. That drops down. Three screws on the top, three screws on the bottom. The faceplate comes off. So anytime I service one of these, I just take it off. That way I don't have to worry about taping it up. You know, no chances of scratching it. It's not on the radio. Um, so, But the only thing to get these meters out, because they do mount from the front. So just take out the four screws around this little metal bracket meter pops out. I'm not sure if it's... Eh, it doesn't seem to be moving. Eh, it flicked there just a bit. Key in the mic. Eh, doesn't seem to be moving. It might could be a bad meter, but you have to remember this radio took one hell of a hit. 
<laughs> I mean, it did. <laughs> it twisted the hell out of this piece of sheet metal here, you know. So, it's not like it took a gentle little love tap. It took it took a hell of a a, a whacking. So it could have da actually damaged the meter movement. Um, I'll check it. If it needs to be replaced, I can can stick a replacement meter in there. One little thing, if you ever uh, work on one of these, um, there are actually more than one thing. When you have the face plate off, there's no better time to clean the switches. And I don't mean the, the actual contacts. Um, I've already done that. What I'm talking about is, you know, if you're cleaning your radio up, you're trying to spruce it up. When you clean the face plate, it's hard to clean these little because uh, these are actually metal. It's a, I mean, it's plastic in the middle, but it has a little aluminum sleeve that goes over top of it. And it's it's hard to clean the, all the gunk that gets trapped inside the faceplate. But when the switches are in the down position, it, you'll have it nice and shiny out here. But you can see it's really dirty as it the farther back in that it gets. Now's the perfect time to do it. You know, you've got it off. You just spray a little bit of glass cleaner on your rag. You know, wipe them off like that and you know they're they're good as new so they've all already done that to those same thing goes with the, the the buttons all your buttons up here while you have it off just spray a little bit of glass cleaner on a microfiber towel you know you can get in between there give them give them a good cleanup while they're easy to access because that's a pain in the butt while you got it apart um i think i've done a video on the face plates before but common thing you'll see with these radios is dirt buildup between this plastic lens and this rear lens. The, the reason that happens is it's not that dirt, dirt is getting in from the outside here in, in between those two layers. The problem is this here and here where the meters go through, it's not solid. Those are two open holes. So any dirt that gets works its way in this front structure here, you know, and through the holes around all the switches, the knobs, the speaker grill, all of that stuff, any dirt that can get in between this faceplate and the front sheet metal structure of this can then work its way through these two meter openings into this cavity here, and it builds up down inside the lens. You'll get dust bunnies and all kinds of crap all over your, you know, your clock lens here and all that. So you know, when you have this off, it's easy to take off three screws along the top, this silver piece then pulls straight up. There's three more screws, or actually four screws, excuse me. Take these four little screws out here, and then you know, there's actually ears that hang down below on this clear lens that have threaded inserts in them. And then this lens pulls straight up and out. Now you may have to you know, kind of pry it, because like I say, they actually fit down into slots, the little ears where the screws mount. But pull that out, then you can get in there, clean all that gunk out and off, and put it back together and have a nice clean one. But yeah, now that I've got the faceplate off, you can see what I was talking about, how the how this is buckled, the entire faceplate actually. Yeah, it just yeah, it's and trying to straighten that out, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> um and you can see even out of the radio, it's still it's still bent and warped. You know, I'll I'll save this one as a last resort one, but uh I think I have still have two good face plates. I think the speaker grill, yeah, it's broken loose because it's actually my fingernail in there. But yeah, there you can see that would had broken out. So yeah, because these are what they call plastic welded. There's just four little ears go through, and then they melt the plastic over on the other side. Well, those ears have apparently completely broken off because the grill's now loose in there. But yeah, I'll save this one as a never know. Somebody might need one that doesn't care what it looks like. Maybe they have one that's completely shattered, but uh, I'll have to dig out one of my spares um, and uh, get that stuck on there after I get done the recap and alignment. So you can see the everything else in here is sitting a lot more level now. So yes, I, I took it out, stuck it in the press, um, was able to get the sheet metal pushed up. The circuit board came up. And the, the bracket on the bottom, the actual sheet metal from the main structure, there's a bracket that drops down and has a bend in it then. There is one screw, there's a screw that goes into that, into the bottom plate of the radio. Um, I was able to get that actually pushed this way, pushed up, because it was actually protruding at the bottom about that far. That's how tweaked it was. Um, even once I got this sheet metal structure here flattened out, the transformer still had one hell of a lean to it. Actually, all four of the, because it's just the sheet metal housings on the end here, they have the little ears that stick out with screw holes in them. 
they were bent. So the ones on this side were bent up and the ones on this side were, you know, bent in the other direction. So I had to take the four screws off there. Didn't have to desolder anything, just took the four screws out. I was able to twist the transformer around enough, you know, in that direction to grab it with a, you know, I said a flat jaw. Oh, these are old, yeah, fence pliers. But a pair of flat jaw pliers, just grab onto it, get all four of the ears straightened out. And that's sitting a, a lot more level now. Honestly, it's actually rare you ever see those things where they're perfectly flat. They almost always have a little bit of a lean to it. So actually, that's probably straighter than, than most of them I've ever seen before. But uh, there you go. So that's just uh, what needs, you know, or the basically what you have to go through if you ever have to take this front structure out. It's not that hard. Four screws here, four down each side, two on the display, two on this little display board, four for each meter clamp. Uh, there's two screws for each one of these switches. Two screws here. Now you kind of have to fiddle around with this, kind of pull it out, twist it around like this, and swing this in behind the other piece, but it can be taken, can be removed out the back without having to desolder or anything. Take all the nuts off for all the controls. Then you can pull the entire structure out, get the four screws out for the speaker, and the two screws that come in from the back side, right, you can actually see them sticking out in this direction, that actually hold the display board in, and it comes right out. So, like I say, it's not extremely complicated. It takes a little bit of time, and I have a lot of screws and nuts there, but uh, it takes a lot longer to put it, to, like most things, it takes a lot longer to put it back together than it does to take it apart, because when you take it apart, you just take all the nuts off and just keep pulling, and parts just fall out. Well, you got to try and get all this... You know, controls line back up, make sure there's no wires trapped in behind, and these speaker wires always tend to get in the way when you're trying to put all these switches and controls back in. Uh, so just make sure, because there is a lot of wires back there, you don't get a wire trapped in between the, the front side of the control and the sheet metal structure, because when you clamp down, you know, tighten down on those nuts, you don't want to pinch one of these wires and end up with a short. But uh, there you go. So now I can get into actually doing the electronics work on this. Uh, get it all put back together then, and it'd be ready to be put back in service. Because um, this is, without a doubt, now I think a lot, pretty much anybody that's ever owned one of these will agree, probably one of the the best. It is not the best, but it's one of the best um, sideband radios ever made. Use the the Cybernet, the Cybernet chassis with the dual circuit boards. They're just so quiet. I mean, there's, there's very few other radios out there that have such a quiet sideband receiver as these. They're just really nice. They had a fairly narrow uh, crystal filter in these things. And this is a crystal filter. It's not a monster like you'll see in some of the Uniden chassis, um, but it's it's bigger than you'll see in the modern radios. Uh, it has a lot to do not just with how many crystals are in a filter, but the actual bandwidth. And this has a fairly a fairly narrow bandwidth, and that's why it's just so pleasant to listen to it. Just it's it's a really steep skirted filter. Um, so it has really good attenuation characteristics. Like I say, it makes for quiet sideband receive. So let me get to it. Now, when, next time you see this, um, I might actually do just a little bit, show you the, the damage uh, from the corrosion on the bottom side. When it comes time to, to do that capacitor, take that one out and clean up the traces. I'm not going to do a whole video on that. I've done that before, you know, trace repair. But I will show what it looks like and, you know, once I get done uh, epoxy overcoating it again so you can actually see the befores and after. Okay, so uh, got the meter replaced now. Here's the uh, the old one, and yeah, it wasn't stuck. I don't know if you can see it or not. The needle moves. It's I I get the feeling because if you've ever had uh, a meter apart before, the wires that attach to the actual in there they're they are tiny, like you know thinner than a than a hair. Um, so I get the feeling that's probably what happened to this. It was that shock when this radio took the hit. It just it just broke the wire. So. Meter's been replaced, so key the radio. You can see we have movement now. Um, also went ahead and uh, pulled out a faceplate. So actually, let's see what uh, see what this one looks like. Get her unwrapped. It, it definitely can't be. <laughs> well, I guess it could be, but for the sake of conversation, I can't see how it could be too much worse than the one that's that's here. Or I wouldn't have bothered to have wrapped it up. To uh, save it as a spare, get my wrap folded up here. Uh oh, oh yeah, much much better. Faceplate's not all kinked up. 
you have got some normal finger, you know, a little bit of finger wear there. But nothing that, uh, none of the silk screening's been rubbed off. Uh, and no breaks. <laughs> no cracked corner here that progresses up to, you know, underneath here. The speaker grill's still in there nice and tight. Uh, I will pop this lens off. Go ahead. Like every GE Superbase that's, that's lived out of the box for any length of time. There's dirt in there, so you can see there's a little pile down in the corners. That's used usually where you'll see it, down in the corners of the lens there. So I'll get all that crap cleaned out of there. But otherwise, yeah, a lot better. Like I say, this, is, this isn't all wrinkled like, uh, oh, where in the hell is it at? Like this one. So big difference. Uh, also went ahead and pulled out a bottom cover. Like I say, foot was broken, it was tweaked, so got a original bottom cover here with all the orig original feet with the original uh, little rubber inserts, the anti-skid inserts. So Now probably what I will do is I will take the, uh, I'll drill the rivets out and swap the data plates. Now this is not the serial number, it's a manufacturer uh, document number and a build date code. Um, but what I, I'll do is I'll go ahead and I will swap those. Uh, that way it does have the correct data plate on the bottom of the bottom of the radio um, the one that actually you know came with it so since I'm changing the sheet metal I want to cha change that plate swap you know take the original one and stick it on here but uh, otherwise yep I think we uh, safely say we got everything we need to uh, bring this back to good looking condition now it's just a matter of a recap job and an alignment to bring it into a peak operating condition Yes, this definitely had leaky cap syndrome. Actually, before I go any farther, let me go ahead and pop this. Come back here, camera. Oh, for Pete's sakes. Things always in my way. Get this ground or shield out of the way. And let me mute my monitor radio there. <laughs> so, the capacitor... Of course, the glare is going to kill me here, isn't it? Damn it. That's still all for Pete's sakes. There we go. Try and get the glare in a different spot. So that electrolytic capacitor that leaks on the other side is right here. And you can see even the traces on this side. So it's, and that's one of the problems is it doesn't just eat the traces because this one's double-sided. This one is single-sided. This is the one that ends up with all the damage. Of course, the components on the other side, when the electrolyte leaks out on that side, it destroys the traces on that side of the board. But don't be surprised. If you ever do one of these, you'll see it, it even soaks through the board, through that hole, and then uh, also starts to corrode the traces on this side. But that's not it. It actually has a couple on this board. Now, you don't see this a lot, but this one, obviously, it has happened. So you can see the dark spot here. If you look on the other side, right here, Actually, it's this 220 right there, that pur purpley one. You can see that one's leaked. Another one's leaked here, and you can see all that darkness. That's corrosion underneath. You know, it's trapped in there. So it's soaked through the hole, you know, and then it can't get out on this side because, of course, it's got this overcoat on it. So it gets trapped in between the overcoat and the copper, and it just eats it away. So, yeah, definitely, if you ever see anything like that, dark spots underneath your silk screen. You know, when there's an electrolyte capacitor on the other side of the board, you definitely, of course, you want to change the cap. It's obviously leaking. It's bad. But uh, you want to clean all this overcoat off and then clean that. Make sure, you know, neutralize it, clean it off really good, and then put some new overcoat on it. Uh, like I say, I use these rush, rush erasers because the fiberglass inserts for these, these things are brutal. There's no other way to put it. They are, and you got to watch it. Um, I've got really, really thick skin. You work with my hands all day, but I can, I impale myself with those things. So just be sure you have a vacuum cleaner handy. After you get done brushing with one of these things, vacuum up the area. The last thing you want is one of those things in your finger, your elbow, and your forearm, because trust me, I've ended up with those little splinters in me all over the place. But uh, basically all you're going to do is just come in, and you can see what I mean by how harsh these are. They just take the overcoat right off. But that's, you know, basically the whole process. You know, of course, I'll remove the component to clean it off really good. But you can see how it's dark under there. That's corrosion. And like I said, it will just continue to progress as time goes on. So you want to clean that all off, get it really nice and shiny, um, you know, so it's like brand, brand new fresh copper. And then you can 
put a conformal coating back over top of it, uh, you know, to protect it again so it doesn't oxidize anymore. But that's that's what you want to do. Like I said, whatever you do, don't leave that stuff on there. It's 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 one day. If, you know, if you recap a radio and you see that, fix it now while it's easy, um, while you don't have to do any trace repair, other than maybe a little bit of brushing to get the you know the gunk off of there. But if you let that on there for any length of time, it will eventually eat those traces in half, and then you're going to have to come back in and do circuit trace repair. And it's a time-consuming process, cutting out pieces of copper, soldering in, bonding the copper down, you know, doing a proper repair. is very time-consuming cons compared to doing just that, just a little bit of <laughs> scrubbing, clean, re-overcoat, done. So, there you go. Okay, so, we're ready to... Uh, do some epoxy overcoating. Uh, the capacitor is, of course, obviously, and it's been replaced. Um, copper traces are fine, at least on this side of the board. I haven't even gone to the other side first and do this one side at a time. Actually, two, because I'm working on this board, too. But uh, So that's all been cleaned off. Um, it's ready now to have epoxy reapplied to it. And same thing goes up here. So all of the nasty corrosion was, you know, cleaned off of there. Um, down to nice clean bare copper again. Uh, so both of those caps, which both were 220s, and one just rolled on the floor. Ugh. So, and of course these also had the corrosive glue on them, but so they'd been leaking out. And it's not like they rupture; it just leaks out, leaches out around the terminals. And it oozes down, oozes up through the board, and it takes such a microscopic amount of this stuff to do a lot of damage. Um, now, the bigger one on the underside there, um, that thousand microfarad, that's this one. You can see, and anytime you pull this one off, you can see, you know, the corrosive glue comes with it. But yeah, a lot, all the overcoat that was on those traces under there, it all ripped off. So yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I might have to do some trace repair, but keeping the fingers crossed, it's just it'll it'll turn out like this. Just a matter of cleaning and re-overcoating. But there you go. There's the progress so far. So epoxy's been mixed and put down now. Actually, I'm just using up the last of my uh, regular two-part epoxy. Uh, I've actually been switching over to UV cured. Uh, overcoat. Um, so I got some of this that's opened up. I'm going to finish using that. So of course this takes curing time. <laughs> Just good old time. But uh, that's been covered up and same thing goes over here. I got to roll the solder on here to kind of keep the board flat because it is, you know, a gelatinous state so it can flow if the board's sticking up at too steep of an angle. But uh, that's basically all there is to it. Like I say, just a good cleanup job. Um, put some new overcoat over it and you know it's the traces are now protected all that nasty corrosive crap that you know came out of the out of the caps has uh, been cleaned off of there and sterilized basically so okay now I can once this cures I'll get the uh, which actually not so much cure but once it sets up um, I can get the this board flipped back down just stick one screw in it to hold, hold the board down and flip it over and uh, See how bad the uh, damage is going to be on the other side, because this was the easy side, actually. The other side's the side, now I'm going to have to take out a lot of parts. All these surrounding parts, they're all going to have to come out, so I can, you know, clean around anything. But, uh, there we go so far. Okay, so, woohoo! No trace uh, replacement needed on this one. <laughs> Got lucky for once. Um, usually, once they start the leak, which... Honestly, most of the time in these radios, yeah, it'll severely damage these two traces here at the least. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, everything had corrosion on it, but it cleaned up really well, so really nothing needed to do there. Um, now I did uh, pry up this connector housing, which I normally do, and I'm so I can just inspect underneath, make sure because some of these traces run up underneath the back there, just to inspect them. That you know, corrosion really didn't get any anywhere past actually about this point. Um, a little bit over here, and actually the trace is cut here. That's a, a factory bodge, <laughs> I guess you would call it, on the extremely early. Now, this is an early one because it is only a serial number or a thousand and something, but the, the really early ones, um, you won't see some of these cut traces. Same thing on the other side of this board. There's a few other uh, bodges that they did, um, and they were factory modifications. Uh, but it had spread out here, around here a little bit, and this way. So... 
I've seen them really bad. I mean, out in an area like this, where every component in this entire area would have to be removed, traces cleaned, all these pass-throughs removed, um, several traces replaced. So yeah, actually not bad. Uh, so just cleaned it up with the fiberglass brush, uh, cleaned it off with you know, neutralized it, and then cleaned it off with some alcohol. Um, and I'm ready to uh, put down a coating of uh, epoxy now, and uh, I'll heat cure that. And I'll be ready to start the cap job then. Uh, and finally get this thing uh, put back into service. And here we go. So the radio is pretty much completely done now. With the exception of in reinstalling, well not reinstalling because they're not the originals. But installing uh, the top and bottom covers. Um, did have a almost mint condition top cover. For a replacement, I still need to clean this, so it's a little, little bit dirty, but uh, no scratches or whatnot in it, not bent up at all. Really, really nice condition. So, because the original, which uh, I think it's out in the other room, it's it's just crumpled right here. It's just yeah, it looks like a slinky almost. <laughs> so, um, like I say, other than putting the top and bottom covers on, it's all done. So you seen the uh, sheet metal get replaced behind there the uh, replacement faceplate has been installed it does have a few little minor dings and scratches but it uh, sure in hell is a lot better than the one that had the the crack that went from here progressed to the underside um, the twisted up uh, front aluminum trim plate right there and everything um, so, yeah, I did take the lens out cleaned all the dust bunnies out so you know should be good for another 30 years before the <laughs> dust monsters need to be cleaned out behind there again um, and the main reason people love these radios, it's, I mean, honestly, you have a hard time finding ham rigs. Um, I've had a lot of ham rigs on this bench that just, they don't come anywhere close to the, uh, the sensitivity of one of these rigs. Um, so, and these chassis were used in a very, very, very few different radios. Two, uh, GEs. And what? Two Midlands. Uh, I think that might be it. Maybe four radios. <laughs> but like I say, just a phenomenal or amazing sideband receivers in these things. I mean, there are no slouches on AM, but you know, that any radio can do AM good. It's sideband is where radios really shine. So I have it hooked up to the communications test set back there. Um, it's on channel 19. I have it in the lower sideband. Uh, I have the signal generator set at 27.184, because that's, you know, 1,000 hertz, the offset for sideband. Um, I'm feeding it with minus 133 dBm, which is 0 0.05 microvolts. And that meter right there is reading SYNAD. In fact, you can see that little light right above my finger there. That's indicating that it's in SYNAD measurements. So I'll turn the volume up. Yeah, you show me almost any CB or ham rig, <laughs> you know, there are, there's other ones out there, don't get me wrong, but very few, but almost 20 dB Synad. I mean, wow. I mean, it just, like I say, the reception on these things in sideband, you know, it's, it's flickering between 19 to 20. It's hovering right there on the edge. You know, 12 dB Synad is the, is the gold standard at, the, you know, whatever the lowest, uh, signal level you can get. 12 dBs you know, is, is known as the, the minimum uh, required for clear uh, two-way communications with you know, voice communications. Um, and you want that at the lowest signal level possible. Well, the signal generator there, that's as low as it goes. 0 0.05 microvolts or minus 133 dBm and that's just pushing the boundaries of 20 dB Synad. I mean, wow. <laughs> so, you know, Enough said. <laughs> um, so, like I say, face plates on, all cleaned up, all back together. Electrolytic capacitors have all been replaced. So, it's just a matter of putting it back together now. Uh, didn't really need a lot of electrical done, you know, other than, re re you know, re not replacing, the, but, uh, you know, repairing the corroded traces. Like I say, luckily there was no actual trace, you know, severe trace damage done. So I was able to just clean it up, basically sanitize the area, clean off you know the original overcoat and just re-epoxy overcoat all that. But uh, 
yeah, she's she's back in good looking condition and fantastic operating condition now. So, uh, you know, GE super based, saved from the scrap pile basically because <laughs> it was. I mean, it did work, but yeah, it was it was a homely looking thing, as as tweaked up and cracked as it was. So, yeah, you can see there's a little bit of rub marks there, a little scratch. So like I say, it does have. Uh, actually, this side's good. I think there's a little bit of wear on the bottom corner. You know. Like I say, it does have a few battle scars on this face faceplate. Um, that's the best one that I had uh, to stick on here. But like I say, definitely better than the original that was on this thing. This aluminum plate's in really, really nice condition. Um, no cracks. So there we go. So another successful restoration. And another, another one of my favorite radios can now be uh, someone can put back into service.